What is this uh, seminar <laughs> series called? Crucial Conversations. Crucial? Crucial Conversations. And where does this fall? Is this the beginning of the Crucial Conversation series? We've had a couple. We've had one on um, uh, the woman at the wall and the discussions over the Kotel. And I think this is our second or third one. Third, we also had one on pornography. And we had one on pornography. <laughs> yes. Oh, good. Internet and, pornography. And, and what's coming up? Julia, what's coming up? Um, we are going to be partnering with Hadassah in the spring to be doing um, part of their Defining Zionism series around modern Zionism and, and Israel. Um, and we're looking forward to that. Well, it was a conversation between, the, the point of it was not to have a debate about Donald Trump, it was to explain the Jewish community position and where the Jewish community is post-election and where it's going. So we wanted to get people who could analyze that. So we had Dan Schnoor, who's a Republican um, GOP person, who's also a, a political analyst. We had Sharon Browse, who's very involved in the progressive community. We had Ari Siegel, who represents the Orthodox community. And we had Jonathan Greenblatt, who's the head of a nonpartisan major Jewish organization. So we felt it was a really good, and, and we couldn't have 10 people on the panel, so we felt it was a really good array of people. We also had Jonathan Greenblatt, who's become quite a, a national figure because of this campaign. We had him in town for a day, so we really wanted to take advantage of that. Thank you so much. But without further ado, I want to introduce David Suisa to, to introduce our panelists. But as crazy and emotional and chaotic, as intense as all this is, I just feel it's also a test for Judaism. It's a test for our tradition to see if we can rise to the occasion and still have respectful dialogue no matter what. So I want to uh, recognize my colleague Rob Eshman. I think he's here. I want to recognize Rabbi Ari Schwartzberg, wherever he is. He called me a month ago and he said he wanted to do something for the whole community and he and I talked and we put this thing together with the help of uh, Julia Moss and everyone on the panel and Danielle is going to introduce the panel I hope or I'll introduce the panel I know them Daniel Schnur uh, yeah from USC my friend Jonathan Greenblatt the head of the ADL we spent a lot of time together uh, recently and I think he's been in the news lately as you might have noticed um, Sharon Browse, who leads this spiritual community called Ikar. They actually pray right here in Shalhevet. Just think of that. Speaking about uh, multi-denominational coexistence, Ikar is the one place where if you wear flip-flops, you're overdressed. So it's extremely, it's a, it's a great place. I've been there many times and I love it. And the head of Shalhevet School, where my kids go, uh, I have two kids right here in Shalhevet, Ari Siegel. Ari writes these uh, great uh, weekly reports that enlighten us, and he's in the Orthodox community. He's the one that's known for really pushing the envelope. We're delighted that he can join us. Daniel Barron from the Jewish Journal, covers Hollywood and many other things. And without further ado, let's have a conversation. Uh, we're very excited uh, to have this evening. This is an incredible opportunity for our community to engage in civil discourse, one of the primary values of living in a democracy. It's an opportunity for us to learn from one another, and if we can't learn from one another, then at the very least we could listen to one another. Uh, I'm also, I was just told that the panelist with the best answers this evening is going to get an all expenses paid vacation to Trump Tower in New York, <laughs> courtesy of the Jewish Journal. Just kidding, but um, I'm sure we could at least arrange for a discounted subscription. So I want to say a quick word about the format tonight. We really want this to be a dinner style informal conversation, so I'm not going to ask all of you the same question. Feel free to jump in if you have something you're burning to say, please, of course, don't interrupt your fellow panelists. And since our discussion tonight is really about political values and Jewish values, I thought it would be a nice place to start to talk about what those are for each of us. So the first thing I want to ask each of you is, what is your top political value and what is your top Jewish value and tell us the ways that President-elect Donald Trump either embodies or contravenes those values. <laughs> Who'd like to start? <laughs> 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 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Then, um, uh, Jonathan, why don't we start with you? So first of all, I want to thank um, the Jewish Journal for hosting this, which is really quite neat. You know, I lived here for a long time, and it's a pleasure to always come back to Los Angeles. And it's a pleasure to do it at the invitation of Rob Eshman and my good friend David Suisa. And I'm delighted to be here with you, Danielle, and with this really esteemed group. Um, so thank you for that and give me that chance. Um, so what's my most important political or most uh, prized political value? So I have to answer you not as maybe Jonathan Greenblatt, but as the CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, an organization which was founded over 100 years ago with a very um, clear mission, which is to, quote, stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment to all. So for over 100 years, we have been fighting anti-Semitism and bigotry in all its forms while working to secure civil rights and social justice for all Americans. And it's actually a very Jewish idea about being for ourselves while also being for others. And then in the act of being for others, essentially, being for ourselves. So for us, I think, for the ADL, I think one of our most prized values is pluralism is the notion of an America that represents the best of all of us, an America that enshrines and elevates all of us, not despite, but perhaps because of our differences. And so I think as it relates to this current political climate, look, it was a very tough campaign. And already it would seem, as they say, that elections have consequences. And I think it is too early to say what this new administration will do. We just yet don't know. So to answer the question, like, how does this administration either exemplify or contravene our values, I would say we don't yet know. I think it is worth noting that whether you like this president-elect or not, and all of you know, or some of you may know, some of the statements that we've made over the course of the last 12 months. This man walks into the Oval Office with a more intimate relationship with the Jewish people than any president in the history of the United States of America. So I, just, I really just want to point that out because I know there'll be a lot of back and forth about it. The notion of having Jewish children who are Shomer Shabbos is really, in the first family is a pretty remarkable thing. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Rabbi Braus, uh, top political value, top Jewish value, and does President-elect Donald Trump either embody or contravene those values? Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for all of you for being here tonight, and I think it really reflects a very de desperate hunger in the community for us to connect in what I hope will be a very respectful way about uh, what the future might hold for our community and for us as individuals and really for the nation. Um, top Jewish value, um, I, I would have to say, is the innate dignity of every single human being, all of us as children of God. Um, thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> um, that is, to my mind, uh, the core and foundational claim that lies at the heart of our tradition and drives um, our engagement in the world, drives our ritual encounter, drives our calendar um, over the course of the year, drives our liturgy, um, and, is, uh, and is, I believe, the, also the core driver for Jews as political, um, as political actors in this country as well. Um, I would certainly hope that as a democracy, that our goals and objectives would similarly be to honor and respect and uphold and help manifest the dignity of every single individual in this country. And while I agree with Jonathan that we have no idea where this is gonna go and where he'll lead us, I think we've been given some very strong indications. Let us not forget that this campaign began um, with some wild accusations about Mexicans as rapists, which many of us felt should have been disqualifying um, for any candidate to, uh, to political office. Um, and then continued over the course of the next 17 months to say things that 
um, that I believe cut against the grain of many of our shared principles um, of what it means to live in any collective society, particularly in one that tries to uphold the dignity of its individual members. Um, we've also seen the building of a cabinet over the course of the past couple of weeks that I think is giving us some strong hints of the direction that the administration will go. So on one hand, yes, we will we'll wait and see where it goes. On the other hand, I think it would be foolish to ignore the signals that have been sent to us in very strong ways over the course of the past um, several weeks and the past many months. Thank you. Dan? Well, uh, I, I, I want to echo what you've heard from our first two panelists. How that one. Yeah, sure, there, sure. Uh, Try that one. Pass it over here. Pass it over here. Let me see if I can get it. Always good to have a microphone mechanic on. <laughs> first of all, I want to echo what our, uh, the first two panelists said. I want to let you know how grateful I am to be able to be with you tonight to be part of this conversation. And uh, I'm grateful to the Jewish Journal uh, for not only for what they're doing for us tonight, but for what they do for our community all day, every day. Let's give David and Rob and Danielle and their colleagues a round of applause. <laughs> Um, many, many years ago, uh, when I was growing up, uh, a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, um, my first paid job was as an intern for the Wisconsin Jewish Chronicle. And so whenever I pick up the Jewish Journal, it brings back very fond memories. And uh, you guys do an amazing job. We're all very grateful to you. Thank you. To finally get to your question, Danielle, um, my Jewish values are my political values, and my political values are my Jewish values. And I don't think you can or should separate the two. If we don't formulate the way we look at the world, the challenges of public policy and politics based on our morals, our ethics, our values, and our heritage, I'm not sure where we should draw those lessons from. So what are my Jewish and my political values? Um, I grew up in a very strong Jewish community that helped me at a time when I could not have uh, helped me accomplish a lot of things that I could not have accomplished myself. So I believe in giving of myself to make my community a better place to live mm. for my friends, my neighbors, and my family. Um, my Jewish and my political values involve standing up for the things I believe in, whether they happen to be popular or unpopular. And most importantly, uh, my Jewish and my political values mean defending those who cannot stand up for their own beliefs and who can't, are not in a position to defend them. Um, And then they came for me. Um, I'm going to quarrel with the premise of the second half of your question, Daniel, with, with, with all due respect. Do you ever notice, by the way, when someone says, with all due respect, there is no respect to follow in the immediate future? Um, I don't think it's a productive use of our time to uh, engage in a great deal of commentary um, about the president-elect or his prospective actions or statements going forward. I tried to divide the world into things that I can impact and those that I can't. And I feel like we have two options here tonight. Number one, we can have a contest to see who is the most upset, the most unhappy, or the most outraged with the outcome of last month's election. And that would be a very cathartic and in some ways a very enjoyable experience. <laughs> I think the much more productive use of our time, if I may, is to talk about what we can do as individuals and as a community, given the challenges that we and the broader community that we face, uh, that we face are. And I won't be presumptuous enough, given the rest of the panelists, to outline what I think those next steps are in this answer. But what I suggest for the conversation is there's plenty of pundits. And we can all do it, we can all do it well, but when you go home tonight, you can watch that on CNN, you can log on and read it somewhere else from people smarter than me. But if we're all gonna take the time to gather in a room like this at a time like this, let's talk about what we can and should do as a community, because this really is a tremendous challenge for all of us. Thank you. And finally, Rabbi Siegel, let's hear from you. So going forth on the first question, they've left a little, very little uh, ground to cover, but um, for, for the Jewish value, I don't think we need look further than the historical debates between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, who are historically known for just going at it, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, 
giving very little ground and, and challenging each other and really disagreeing at their most basic and core level. Um, but what we know is, is that our rabbinic tradition, tradition tells us that Hillel was actually chosen as the winner, even though often Shammai was right. And the Talmud tells us the reason that was, was because Hillel was humble. Hillel was gentle. And when Hillel would quote the debate, he would quote Shammai's opinion first. And so for me, if you ask me what my number one Jewish value is, uh, is debate but with humility. I think that's been sorely lacking in this election. Uh, I, all I hear about is each side eviscerating the other, the other side. Trevor Noah just wrote about this, that he was told he needed to eviscerate the other side. I don't think it's any different for uh, the conservative talk show personalities, that their goal was not just to disagree, but to mock, to minimize, to really demean and demonize. Uh, and so if you ask me what my Jewish value is, it's that. It's debate with humility and, and really deep humility. Uh, I, if you want me to comment on whether Donald Trump has humility, I, I don't know that I need to. I think the audience can probably uh, make their own uh, guess about his humility. In terms of the political value, for me, I, I go to education. There's nothing, if I could teach nothing else and students would leave the school with nothing else, it would be to have empathy for the other, to understand where the other comes from. Uh, I think that's about what Hillel was doing. He's trying to understand where Shammai comes from, even if he disagrees. And empathy to me uh, is sorely missing. And I will say this, whatever you think about Donald Trump, whether you like him or hate him, think this is the greatest moment or just Armageddon, he, he did show empathy in this, in this election. Maybe not for everybody, but the states, you know, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, felt that he was more empathetic than, than uh, Hillary Clinton. And I think that's what won it for him, because he stood before them and he acknowledged what their, scare, what their fears were and what they were going through. And so I think the greatest political value, which is also I think the greatest educational value, is empathy. Uh, and I think it's something that we as a group need to start doing more of. It means stepping away from ourselves and understanding where the other is coming from. Jonathan, sorry, this, I really don't like this thing. Thank you. Um, uh, Jonathan, um, it is, you've made no secret about your uh, criticisms of Trump during the campaign, and you have even uh, criticized him since the election. So we're now a month out of probably the most divisive election we've seen in many of our lifetimes. And so I want to ask, what's the most troubling thing you've seen from Trump in the month since he was elected, and what's the most reassuring? So I think that uh, it's a hard question, Danielle. I think at the ADL we try very hard. Yes. <laughs> Jewels, but on ideas, right? And to focus not on politics but on principles, like calling out prejudice. And so I think one of the things that's been, let's say, surprising about this campaign, and surprising about Donald Trump as a candidate, was when we and others pointed out things that were troubling, like endorsements from KKK leaders, or that his account was tweeting out images sourced from white supremacists, or that his speeches, whether he wrote them or not, were sprinkled with language that seemed, you know, like a search and replace on the protocols of the elders of Zion. We call that out. What we didn't see was contrition, or acknowledgement. Um, actually, let me just restate that. We didn't see acknowledgement, let alone contrition. And so that was surprising. Um, because most public figures don't react that way when you present them with facts. And I think for those of you who are confused, and I don't know if anyone in the room is confused, if you look at the, this, this phenomenon that we call the alt-right, I prefer to call it by what it is, white supremacy, these are bigots who traffic in anti-Semitism and racism. Um, this, these, are, these are not our friends. And mainstreaming their ideas, normalizing them, I think is very, very troubling. So that's of concern. Have you seen anything reassuring? We, look, 
at the same time, when we put, after David Duke, uh, another David Duke incident, he went out on the record and disavowed anti-Semitism. In his remarks on election night, he talked about unity. Uh, there is work to be done to show fidelity to that idea of unity. There is work to be done to make real and manifest this notion of bringing people together. Um, and we're hopeful that we'll see it. Jonathan, you and the ADL in particular have come under some heavy criticism by some in the Jewish community for speaking out against these very things that you're naming. Um, how do you respond to the accusation that the ADL is becoming a partisan organization? Look, it's interesting um, and maybe somewhat unsurprising. I'm an easy target for those kinds of accusations because I worked in the Obama administration. Full disclosure, three and a half years. Full disclosure, I worked in the Clinton administration. Big deal. When I say big deal, no one accused me of being partisan when I came out in, against the Iran deal, much to the umbrage of my former colleagues in the White House, including my old boss. But let's put aside your personal background for a moment. What about the fact that you represent a mainstream Jewish organization that has a diverse membership and the notion that when you speak for or against uh, the president of the president elect of the country that you are in essence that the notion that there's the perception of partisanship is is real well here's what I would say about that one thing we will never do is we will never tolerate intolerance period and if you think And to those who think that's political, so be it. But I'll remind, I'm reminded of a story at ADL. So in the early 1950s, there was debate at ADL when there was a case before the Supreme Court that didn't necessarily seem exactly hued to our mission. It was the Brown v. Board of Education case that came before the Supreme Court to desegregate the schools. And the ADL filed an amicus brief on behalf of Brown much to the consternation of some in the Jewish community, much to the consternation of some inside ADL. But ADL came out in support of desegregation because our principles required us to do so. And ADL will speak out against cheerleaders for white supremacy because our principles mandate that we do so. And ADL will speak out on behalf of those who seek to harm the Jewish people because our, again, mission mandates that we do so. Thank you. Rabbi Braus, um, during the election, as many of us know, Trump singled out uh, pretty frequently immigrants and minorities, uh, often blaming them for various American problems. What should the Jewish response be to Trump's proposed Muslim ban or Muslim registry? And, and secondly to that, why should we take him at his word when he has shown himself to be unpredictable and even at times ideologically flexible? to put it nicely. Okay. Well, I think all we can do is take people at their word when they make claims that what they'd like to do is create registries and register people, re register religious minorities. I think we have to believe that that's what they really want to do. When they make claims that they want to deport millions of, um, of immigrants, I think we have to assume that that's what he really wants to do. Now, time will tell, of course. We, have, we don't know what he'll do, um, but I think we have to take him seriously. Um, I, I find it astonishing that, um, that there is not more of a universal outcry in the Jewish community about this. Because of our history, because of our values, because of who we believe ourselves to be in the world. And, and I want to just say that this is not a Romney presidency. This is not, I mean, Jews we know vote historically Democratic, somewhere between 71 and 78% of the Jewish uh, community in America has voted, de has voted Democratic for the past many elections, right? So this is, not, this is not about disagreements on policy and is it acceptable to be one of the, um, not, someone who's not in the 71 to 78% or not? Is there room for debate here? What this is about is who are we at the core as a people? And what does our history teach us about what it means to be a vulnerable minority 
that witnesses the rise of a fascistic leader who indicates that he has all intentions of targeting individual minority communities. What then is our obligation? And I'll just tell you, I was at a, I was at a Jewish Muslim um, lunch gathering about a week after the election, and one of my friends there, um, who, who is a, actually a Muslim from Turkey, said that he was absolutely terrified because this reminded him of exactly what happened in Turkey as it slipped toward authoritarianism. And he said the way that Erdogan was able to be successful in Turkey was that he went after individual minority communities, one after the next after the next, and none of them stood up for the others. And then as a result, you know, wake up one day and all of a sudden everyone's saying, how did this happen? This is a story that we as Jews know all too well. And I believe it's absolutely our obligation and responsibility to be unequivocal in standing by and standing for those, uh, those minorities that are being targeted. Now, in a very practical sense, what does it mean? So this we're still figuring out. Now, many people in the progressive Jewish communities stood up immediately and said, if there's a registry, I will register, right? If you want to register Muslims, it's like the, um, the Danish you know, king, we will all put on a yellow star. Um, some friends in the Muslim community say thank you very much, but that's not actually what we want. Uh, we don't want more people registering, we don't want anyone registering. And I think what's really critical at this moment is we actually have to strengthen our relationships with the Muslim community, with the Mexican community, with the Salvadoran community, with, with immigrant communities and religious minority communities so that we are on the same page when we see what will come down in the coming months so that we can determine what the best and most strategic way is to respond. Rabbi Siegel, many in the Orthodox community, including a majority of Shell Hevet students here, uh, voted for Trump in a mock election. So even though a majority of Jews voted for Hillary Clinton, how do you explain this split? Uh, I'm glad that the Shell Hevet Boiling Point student newspaper is a first source <laughs> um, for news. We, and we read the, everything at the Jewish Journal. <laughs> and that the Shell Hubbard student body is somehow uh, representative of the country. I actually was talking with Rabbi Browse before the panel started, and, and uh, we were discussing how the Shell Hubbard student body voted. It was something like 54% in support of Trump, uh, 46 in support of uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, first of all, I was stunned, uh, to be honest. If you would have asked me before the election, this mock election, how our student body would have voted, I would have almost guaranteed you that it was something like 70-30 Clinton. Uh, that was my assumption. Uh, and so when the mock election results came out, I actually had a moment of uh, deep self-reflection. Uh, what I realized, and I think what all of America realized, is that it, we have come to a point where there are lots of people, people who we work with, people we respect, people who are our friends and colleagues, who planned on voting for Donald Trump, knew that when they got in the voting booth they were gonna go for, vote for Donald Trump, but didn't tell that to anybody. They didn't tell that to their friends at Shabbat tables or at their works, you know, workplaces. They didn't tell that to the pollsters. Uh, and I think that is a, is a moment for, uh, whoa. Uh, it's not just about the Orthodox community, I think it's about a lot of communities. Um, I have a few things that have gone through my mind. Um, I'll try to narrow it down to maybe the top one or two that I think are, are particularly important. First of all, I, I, I want to take it as a badge of honor. I'll take it as a moment to pat the students of Shalhevet on the back. I, I wish that we had communities that weren't echo chambers. I can assure most of us that our synagogues and our communities and our places of worship are far more divided very clearly in one direction or the other. America isn't. America is divided seemingly right down the middle. I think it's a badge of honor that the Shalhevet students feel comfortable enough and that there's some level of open-mindedness and we've created some safe space for debate that there was a, a middle ground there. I, I do feel that way. I will tell you it's also a very difficult position. I promise you I have parents who want to know why there were so many students who voted for Donald Trump. What a terrible thing. And I have parents who, and students who want to know why you know, so many people voted for that Hillary Clinton. I can't believe it. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a tough few weeks. Um, I have a few thoughts. I, I think first and foremost, I, I think people, and, and this is hard to, I, I don't know that people articulated this, and, and let me be clear, I think the bigger question that you didn't ask is, how did anyone vote for Donald Trump, who's a religious, committed person, when his seemingly, I don't know him personally, his personal values are so at odds 
with the entire fundamentalist religious community. That was my next That's question. That's your next question. Okay, so I'll just wrap it into one and we don't have, I can take the time. Uh, you but, I think, but I think the question is, if, if, Jewish, if he so clearly contradicts Jewish values in the minds of so many Jewish voters, right. how could the observant community vote for him? So a couple important points. First of all, Haaretz reported that only, that 54% of Orthodox Jews voted for Hillary Clinton, which is surprising. Right, you would assume. I know that there are pockets of the ultra-Orthodox and Orthodox community that voted for Trump, but I think it's very important for us to realize we have some imagination of like the entire Orthodox community voting for, for Donald Trump, despite his personal values. So first and foremost, I think facts are important before we get into opinions. Uh, second, uh, listen, I think that, that there is a strong sense in the religious community uh, unspoken, a fear that religious liberty is rapidly being infringed upon. Uh, where a baker who's a lovely person who owns a business, who believes in a, whether you agree with it or not, but some people feel an outdated idea of biblical morals that thinks marriage is the, you know, a man and a woman together, that they should lose their business because they won't make a cake uh, for that couple. That, uh, the Obama administration decided and made a very big statement by saying, hey, we feel bathrooms need to be transgendered. And Shalhevet is, I think, at the forefront of LGBT rights in the Orthodox and Jewish community. But that president, you don't have to, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, that, that that moment was coming, I think there was an unspoken fear among religious communities, obviously not the Muslim community, I don't think they saw this as a, him as a knight in shining armor, but I think they saw President-elect Trump as the religious liberty candidate. The candidate who was going to say, slow down for a second, we need to think more deeply about this before we just say that all of America, religious and not religious, needs to follow America's uh, moral standard. I, I think that, that that's a massive piece of it. I think Israel is obviously a massive piece of it. If we want to pretend that that's not, I mean, I, I think we hesitate to say that. We're going to get to that in a little bit. Okay, so, so I'll hold you. off on saying um, that. But does that's... anybody want to respond to Trump as the religious liberty candidate? <laughs> Anyone? Any takers? <laughs> okay. I believe it um, deeply. Dan, I want to ask you, you're, you are a, you know, a political <laughs> analyst. When you look at the Jewish community as a whole and we see this divisiveness and there's lots of different statistics about which group voted in which direction, but we pretty much roughly know that you know, a third of the Jewish community voted for Trump and 70% voted for Hillary Clinton. When you look at that, what are the policy areas in which the Jewish community is in sync and where are the policy areas that we are most at odds? Well, it's a, it's a terrific question. Also, I just want to ask real quickly, I appreciate everyone's applause, and you will have ample time at the end to give a round of applause to everyone, so let's try to limit it now so we can jump. We have a lot of material to cover, and I would appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. It's a great question, and if you'll indulge me for a second before I answer it, I also want to, answer, I want to briefly answer the question you asked Jonathan, because I think while he did an admirable job of sticking up for himself, I think the rest of us regardless of whether you happen to agree with him or not, have to agree to stand up for him and admire him for what he has done over the last months. And I will tell you why. Because accusing somebody who disagrees with the President of the United States or any political figure of being, a par of being partisan is simply intellectual laziness. Jonathan has said very little about Donald Trump, that Jeb Bush did not, that John Kasich did not, that Paul Ryan did not. And in fact, if you want to go back a little bit further into the past, former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton had some very critical things to say about President Barack Obama that did not make her, uh, that did not mean that she was acting in a partisan manner against him. What he did was not partisan. What he did was patriotic. And what an organization like the ADL does every day, every year so admirably, is whether our political leaders are Democrat or Republican, they stand up for the things that we believe in as a community. And for that, he deserves our respect and our admiration and our applause. <laughs> so with that, um, look, how does the Jewish community divide on matters of public policy? It's pretty straightforward. Um, it's Israel versus domestic policy. Um, most public opinion polling in recent years have shown that the safety and security of Israel 
is now anywhere between the fourth and the seventh most important issue to most American Jews. Now you might consider that a good thing, you might consider that a bad thing, but it's a thing. And so while the Republican Party has worked mightily to convince our community that being stronger on Israel should earn their votes, the majority, roughly two-thirds of American Jews have said, well, that's fine, but both parties are strong supporters of Israel. And if one party happens to be a slightly stronger and less questioning supporter of Israel, that's important to us, but not nearly as important to us as a community as where that party stands on an array of social and cultural issues. So when it comes right down to it, one party appeals to the Jewish vote on Israel, the other party appeals to the Jewish vote on abortion rights and on marriage equality, um, on any other number of social and cultural related issues, and the American Jewish community, by roughly a two to one margin, has decided that between two parties who are good on Israel, they'll opt for the party on which they're more comfortable on domestic and social policy. Thank you. Rabbi Brous, I want to ask you if um, Trump clearly contradicts the Jewish value that you talked about at the beginning, at least in his statements so far. Why do you think so many in the observant community voted for him? And is there something that perhaps less observant Jews know about Judaism that the more observant community doesn't seem to understand? <laughs> sure, I'd love to enter the fray there. Um, <laughs> I, um, first let me say, if this is comforting at all, that it is not the Jews alone um, who, where you will find that the voting patterns um, when it comes to religious observance um, become, uh, there's a proportional relation between increased religious observance and, um, and a likelihood of voting in a more conservative way. So in the church, the more, off, the more times um, a month you go to church, the more likely you are to vote Republican. Um, so it's not, it's not terribly surprising to me. Throughout the country, we see that the more religious people are, the more likely they are to, to vote in a conservative way. Now, we can spend you know, the next two hours, and I'd be delighted to have this conversation as to what that is. Is it because there is messaging that's coming from our... Um, from our sacred institutions that's pushing people toward conservatism? Is it because people who are prone toward conservatism also find a home in religious communities? Um, I don't know, but I do, I mean, so the first thing is that the, the, more, the more observant, uh, the more stringent your observant on Shabbat, uh, the more likely you are to show up in shul on Shabbos morning, the more likely you are to vote Republican. Um, and that's, that's just the reality across the board in religious life in America today. But why particularly the Jewish community? Um, I, this is something that I, that I think a lot about, and, um, and I think it's just as stated that it, that it has to do uh, with Israel and with a sense, a, a profound sense of vulnerability um, around Israel. There are more people um, in the progressive Jewish communities who now believe that support of Israel doesn't come only in the form of supporting a right-wing, ultra-nationalist Israeli government. That support of Israel and love of Israel can be expressed in many ways, including supporting democracy and civil society in Israel, including going to spend time and living in Israel, including making Aliyah, but there isn't only one form of support of Israel, which means political alignment with one uh, particular shade of the Israeli political spectrum. And so um, I, I hear that conversation much more broadly outside of the Orthodox community, and my sense is that, um, that that's where there, there might be a significant difference in between what's happening um, inside Orthodoxy and, and outside Orthodoxy in the Jewish community, a profound sense of vulnerability and the belief that the way to support Israel is to support Israel's government. Jonathan, if there is this prevailing perception right now that the ADL is becoming more partisan, what role can the ADL hope to play in the more observant community that did vote for Trump? Well, look, the ADL has been, for over 100 years, we've been working with White Houses since Woodrow Wilson, with Democrats and Republicans. And with this re the White House we currently have now, we may agree with President Obama on some things and we disagree on other things, and we find ways to work with him, as we did his Republican and Democratic predecessors. So I would challenge, I would challenge the claim that we're somehow more partisan today, we're not. 
And we have always worked with reform and conservative and orthodox communities because I have a very simple job description. It's defend the Jewish people, regardless of how they pray or you know, how they spend Shabbat. Dan, you were an advisor to a USC LA Times poll that, contrary to popular polling results, showed Trump consistently ahead for a very long while. But you also said that the reason this particular poll stood apart was because it actually measured the intensity of Trump support. So how do you explain the reasons for the zealousness with which Trump supporters supported him? Another good question. Um, so just for, for the record, for the last seven years, I've served as the director of the USC Dornsife LA Times statewide political survey here in California, uh, which has been the most accurate of the statewide political polls in the last three elections. <laughs> but uh, this year, as Danielle mentioned, we uh, took on an experiment with our friends in the Center for Economic and Social Research at USC. And they pioneered a very innovative way of polling given the real crisis that exists in the polling industry. We've seen, you know, polling wildly off the mark on the so-called Brexit vote, on the elections in Israel, in Greece, and on the midterm elections here, even heading into this election. And what these very smart people uh, concluded is that simply asking a voter whether they prefer candidate A or candidate B doesn't really tell you all that much. And what we need to measure instead of, do you prefer Trump or Clinton? The question we asked instead is on a scale of zero to 100, how certain are you of your vote? And what our polls showed all summer and fall long is that while more Americans supported Hillary Clinton than Donald Trump, Trump's supporters were much more motivated, much more fervent, and much more certain than their support than Clinton's. And of course, uh, that, and, and, and that gets to the basis of your question. Why are Trump supporters so much more fervent? I'll offer you this. Um, the core demographic that supported Donald Trump from day one, the first day 17 months ago when he descended in that escalator in Trump Tower to announce his candidacy for president, there was a very specific demographic group of voters that were the core of his campaign. Now, he expanded that support considerably over a year and a half, but what he started with was a group of white, working class male voters. And of course, we all know that in 2016 in America, the term working class means didn't go to college. And one of the real challenges I have at USC is convincing a group of really smart people, young people, why someone would choose not to go to college. They understand why someone is not able to go. That they lack the financial resources, they lack the proper educational uh, training and Rabbi, you're exactly right on the most important political issue of the day, being education. And they devote a tremendous amount of time, our students do, to the schools and the surrounding communities to try, try to level that playing field. But what they don't understand is why somebody would choose not to go to college if they had the opportunity. And what I explain to them is that for decades, tens of millions of our fellow Americans were told at age 15 or 16 or 17 that they didn't have to go to college in order to realize the American dream. And they were told, if you get a good job in a factory, on an assembly line, on a construction site, you might not get rich, but you'll own your own home. You might get a vacation cottage or an RV or a small boat that you can use on weekends. And when you retire, you'll have a comfortable pension that will allow you to enjoy your latter years with your children and your grandchildren. And I tell them that tens and millions, tens of millions, of our fellow citizens took that deal. And they did everything we asked them to do. They went to work every day, they volunteered in their churches and synagogues, they did it all, they did one thing wrong. The one thing they did wrong is they happened to come of professional age during the most significant and wrenching economic and technological transformation since the Industrial Revolution. Now I tell my students about the Industrial Revolution, I explain to them that I was not present for the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> but I tell them that 100 years ago, when our society turned from an agrarian to an industrial society, that forced some very difficult, unpleasant choices, but at least we understood those choices, or our grandparents and grandparents did. You went from the farm to the city. And 100 years later, though, what is the equivalent for that 55-year-old white male whose factory just closed? 
He's not going to go to Silicon Valley and acquire financing for a social networking startup. He doesn't know what he's going to do, and he's really, really scared. And all of a sudden, a candidate comes along who says to him, I'm going to make America great again. Now, point of editorial privilege here, I don't like the word again for the same reason that most of you don't. Because whether Donald Trump intended it or not, the word again tells us that he wants to reverse hard-earned and necessary victories for women, for members of minority communities, for friends of ours in same-sex relationships. But if you are a 55-year-old former factory worker who is unemployed, and you hear the word again, you don't think about all those things. You think, here's a guy who's going to open my factory back again. And because you are so scared and because you feel so abandoned by the, le by the leaders of both political parties for so long, that's what motivates you to the level of the term you used was zealousness. Mm -hmm. I would prefer the term desperation that motivated Trump supporters to the polls in such greater numbers than Clinton's. And very quickly, and I know I've been abusing my privilege here, that to me comes back to what we can do as a community. And I respect and I agree wholeheartedly with the rabbi's point about reaching out to the Hispanic American, to the Asian American, to the African American community, and I would argue as necessary, if not more, of any to the Muslim American community. But I think we also have to find a way as our community to reach out to those frightened, desperate, working class voters and explain to them that there are other ways to confront their fears in the way they chose in November of 2016. Thank you. So before we move to the Jewish evergreen topic of anti-Semitism, I want to take a brief moment to tell you we will have some time for audience questions at the end. Um, and we are going to have a few Jewish Journal staff people will be walking around. Eitan over there, Julia over here, and Ryan. They will be passing out cards. So if you have a question, raise your hand. Write your question down on the card and then raise it, pass it to the aisle and they will collect it. So, anti-Semitism. Last week I was in the room when the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, dismissed rising anti-Semitism in the United States as a, quote, fringe phenomenon. Do you agree with this? And is anyone on this panel seriously alarmed about rising anti-Semitism in America, either from the left or the right? <laughs> Bring it, Jonathan. So, <laughs> so I wasn't here. I didn't hear the prime minister say that exactly. But the ADL has been looking at this issue for generations. We do annual studies of anti-Semitic attitudes and incidences. And it is true that in recent memory, uh, we are at a low. Since we started doing polling in the 1960s, the anti-Semitic attitudes in the United States are roughly 12 or so percent. So that is way down from the 40s where we were in the 60s. True. It's also true that if we look at what's happened since the uh, election, we have seen a surge of hate crimes across the country. And I I'm not even going to talk for a moment about the slander and the cesspool that is social media. And what we've seen in, certain, in terms of coordinated harassment and bullying and intimidation and threats against Jewish journalists, some of whom may have experienced this, we're here in the audience with us, or maybe you, Danielle, or other Jewish public figures. I can just tell you that what we track through our 26 regional offices across the country are verbal harassment, acts of vandalism against personal property or public institutions, houses of worship, or Jewish community centers and whatnot, as well as um, physical assaults. And those are up. Literally, the explosion of swastikas that we've seen since uh, election day is stunning. It is like a contagion or a virus. And they are showing up everywhere. So we think, look, let me be clear, I don't think Either side has a monopoly on morality. There is anti-Semitism coming from the extreme right. There is anti-Semitism coming from the radical left. There is anti-Semitism coming from these, you know, these white supremacists. And there is anti-Semitism coming from hardened anti-Israel activists. 
I worry about all of it seeping into the mainstream. And if I look at the incidences that we have recorded in the last four weeks, this is not my just opinion. This is an empirical, measurable reality. Rabbi Browse, I wonder if you could address uh, the anti-Semitism coming from the left. I know you wrote a really powerful piece for us several months ago about the Black Lives Matter platform, and I wondered if you equate that kind of strong, harsh uh, policy statements against Israel as anti-Semitism. Hmm. <laughs> um, first, let me say that um, I, I believe that when we see a rise in attacks on vulnerable minority populations, when we see a rise in hate crimes, we can currently see a rise in anti-Semitic attacks. And so if we think that we ought not be concerned because those who are being targeted right now um, are not primarily from our community, I think we have that, I believe that that's a terrible mistake. And I just want to give one example and then Danielle, I'll try to address your question. Um, there was a story a couple of weeks ago about a Muslim, a young Muslim student on the subway in New York who was uh, an 18 year old riding on the train and a number of uh, angry drunk men um, began to verbally assault her. She was wearing hijab and started to shout at her, go back to your own country, to which she responded, I'm from Brooklyn. And then, uh, and screamed and cursed and shouted, make America great again, make America great again. Um, and she said the most disturbing part of this was that nobody on the train stood up to support her or defend her. At the final paragraph of the story that was written about this, it said the following, that there had been 34 incidents um, between election day and November 27th in the city um, of hate crimes. 34, okay? Um, f compared, to, uh, compared to five in the, in the same period of the previous year. Five of those in in incidents were anti-gay, five others were anti-white, two targeted Muslims, one was anti-black, 18 of them were anti-Semitic in nature. 18 of 34 hate crimes. And so I just want to bring our attention to this because I don't believe that our community um, is, is really taking this as seriously as, as we need to be right now. Many people have noted that it's ironic that right now the left, the Jewish left, is calling the Jewish right to take anti-Semitism more seriously. That's not the way it usually goes in our community. Um, I, I agree with Jonathan. I think we see um, an antipathy toward, uh, toward Jewish privilege, toward Jewish power, and in some cases toward Jewish people coming both from the right and from the left. Um, I don't think that they are equivalent to one another. I think they're, they're both dangerous. Um, but they don't seem, to my uh, eyes right now, um, they don't seem equivalent to one another. Um, the anti the anti-Semitism that I see coming from the left, which I believe is very real and very dangerous and needs to be addressed um, unequivocally, is almost entirely connected to, uh, to Israel and to disputes about Israeli policy and about the nature of Jewish power when it pertains to Israeli policy. The anti-Semitism that we see now coming from the right, which Jonathan described a little bit about this trolling, the, the gassing, these vile images of Jewish journalists and others, um, and incredibly threatening images, seem to be good old-fashioned blood DNA uh, anti-Semitism, right? It's in your blood, and, and the only way to eradicate it is to eradicate you. And so I believe that those are different. They could be equally pernicious, and if you're a college student, you know, just trying to get to Friday night services on campus, um, or going to, uh, walking out of second day Rosh Hashanah at University of Michigan, it doesn't really matter who's screaming at you and calling you a Nazi, but I believe that they are anti-Semitism of a different form. Thank you. Rabbi Siegel, uh, fringe phenomenon or cause for real concern? Uh, so I know that we, listen, we're graduating students who are going to these campuses. Uh, and while it is often couched as anti-Israel uh, rhetoric, I think there is the strong sense that there's often an underlying uh, message of, of anti-Semitism. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I don't know rising now. I, I had never experienced growing up anti-Semitism. I, I went to a day school, uh, really didn't encounter it. My first encounter with anti-Semitism was actually here at Shalhevet. Our students were playing a flag football game against a school, uh, so, you know, in some championship game, and, and good news, we beat them. 
um, I really put a, put a licking on them. And as our students were walking off the field, they saw across the field a kid giving another kid from his team a Hail Hitler sign. He, had, he turned as a joke to mock the Jewish team that had just won. He gave a Hail Hitler sign, which started this unbelievable moment for us. You know, our first initial reaction, and in Shall Have It, we run town halls. So we have everybody discuss and throw out ideas what could be. We should have the kid expelled. We should have the kid suspended. We should know if we do that, the kid's going to hate us and hate Jews even more. How could, you know, every part of it. We should fight. We should have punched the kids in the face. No, we should... Uh, we should have just retreated and walked away. If you walked away, it would be like the Holocaust and nobody did anything. And it was this in-your-face moment of our young people because we're, uh, we're adults sitting in this room. Uh, I, I think we have a huge role to play in combating anti-Semitism. Uh, Jonathan and, and what the ADL does is at the forefront of that. But at the end of the day, it's our 18 and 19-year-olds who are going to college campuses who are going to see this, I think, most acutely in their face. And... I'll tell you what happened in our situation. After the students debated and discussed it, they decided to invite the team from that school to Shall Have It to spend a day, uh, I believe it was with Facing History, discussing how we engage with the other. What does genocide look like? What have the Jewish people been through? What have oppressed minorities been through? What is it like? The kid had no idea what a Hail Hitler sign is. I genuinely have to believe in the deepest, most positive parts of my soul that people who are painting swastikas don't actually genuinely understand what those represent. But it's so much ignorance, it's so much anger, it's so much hate, it's so much pain, and it's just spewing out like, like hateful vomit. And when we met with those students, I'm telling you, and I don't know that we can do this, I don't know that we can take it person by person, anti-Semite by anti-Semite, extremist by extremist, but I, I do think that that's where the battleground is. It's teaching our students, first of all, how to be prideful in their Judaism. Judaism is great, it's not parochial. You don't have to somehow mesh in with everybody and just become some sort of American, you know, uh, chalent for, to, be, uh, to be a good thing. We can be proud Jews. Being a proud Jew is being a great American. But you need to then go out there and engage with the other. You need to hear them. You need to hear their pain. You need to understand where they're coming from. You need to educate them on our history and hear about their history. Judaism has been the oppressed. Hanukkah's around the corner. Pesach. Uh, Purim, you name it, we're the oppressed. We have as much, not just to know and be sensitive, and I, know, I think Rabbi Browse mentioned this earlier, that's, that's our ethical mandate because of who we are. We also have what to teach the world. We have been an oppressed minority for most of our history. It's not the most exciting thing, meaning like if we're the chosen people, uh, maybe choose someone else if we've been so oppressed. Um, but we have what to teach the world. How do you respond when you're oppressed? How do you respond when you're treated this way? Uh, and I think that's our teenagers, that's our kids. Uh, and so I think in, in many ways, I can't tell you whether it's an ongoing threat or not. I just know that as, as educators in shoals and schools and communities, I think it's our responsibility to teach our kids how to engage with this in a, in a way that's going to, to really pay dividends. In a recent sermon, Rabbi Brous declared, quote, the world has gone mad and referred to the appointment of, quote, an alt-right white supremacist purveyor of racist, Islamophobic, and anti-Semitic propaganda as chief strategist to the White House. <laughs> I assume you were talking about Steve Bannon. So my question to the panel is, do you know of anything that Steve Bannon has said that was anti-Semitic? And if not, does his long association with people like Andrew Breitbart and others, strongly identified Jew, suggest that perhaps another dynamic is at work? Well, uh, I'll jump in and uh, simply say that I don't know what's in, um, I don't think any of us know what's in Steve Bannon's heart. We don't really know what his, we d divine what his motives are. But we do know that as executive chairman of that media company, he identified a market segment and felt that his website, Breitbart, could serve it. And he was very explicit. And he said, we will make this the platform for the alt-right. And I will repeat what I said about the alt-right. This is white supremacy in 2016. Racism, anti-Semitism, etc. He saw an opportunity to serve, to meet the needs of that underserved market with media for them and by them. Now look, many have told me he's got Jewish employees. Many have reminded me he opened up a Jerusalem office. That all may be well and good. But we have crunched the numbers. We have looked at the data. 
And anyone who tells you that the alt-right is not a problem is wrong. This is not a fact-based conversation when they tell you this isn't an issue. We looked at 12 months of Twitter data and found more than 2.6, being conservative, 2.6 million anti-Semitic messages, tens of thousands of which were directed at Jewish journalists. The most popular or frequently found terms in the bios of those Twitter users, their accounts, were, and this is not my idea, this is the facts, Trump, white, and nationalist. These were almost overwhelmingly self-identified members of the so-called alt-right. And look, they're having conferences half a mile from the White House, they're starting speaking tours on our college campuses, and they are talking about fielding political candidates in 2018. So, I don't know what's in Steve Bannon's head, and I don't know what's in his heart. I can't speak to what his intentions are. All we can do is focus on the outcomes. And the normalization of anti-Semitism and the mainstreaming of this white supremacy is real, period. And of course, one of the great ironies is at the same time that this is happening, we also, as you said earlier, have Jews very, very close to the White House. There are Jewish members in the president-elect's family. So, Jonathan, you've talked about this. You've said it was a big deal. You opened up the panel by talking about this. So, what is the significance of Trump having Jewish kin, and how might that impact the Jewish community? I don't think we know the answer to that question. So, it's hard for me to, honestly and respectfully, it's hard for me to respond to hypotheticals. But there's just no doubt in my mind that this is a president whose family will be having Shabbat dinners every Friday night for the next four years, period. Now, that doesn't mean, by the way, that that's an excuse for what he might say or do. That doesn't mean, by the way, that just because he has Jewish family members, he gets a pass on anti-Semitism or intolerance. I'm not saying that at all. I'm simply pointing out that it's complicated. And I'm simply pointing out that, you know, painting this in broad brush, good, bad, is not necessarily so easy to do. Uh, how it will turn out, I don't know. Chime in. Uh, I, I, Can I also say one other thing? Karl Marx was Jewish. Right? Right? People say that Vladimir Lenin, who led a lot of stuff, was Jewish. People have researched and found that Hitler had a Jewish grandmother. So. No, I, no, my, I'm not I, comparing, I say, wait a second, I'm not, and I'm not comparing the president-elect to any of those historical figures, but I'm simply trying to point out that those who say he doesn't understand us and has no connection to us are wrong. He does. That doesn't, again, give him a, a get-out-of-jail-free card. Just say, you know, it doesn't, but we should acknowledge that it's complicated. After covering Hollywood for many years, I always like to say that everybody's either a little bit Jewish or a little bit anti-Semitic. I wanted, to make a, I wanted to make a point that I think probably is going unnoticed. Uh, I don't know if many people are following uh, what's going on in Israel with the conversion issue. It's an issue that's been uh, really divisive both in Israel and also in America. Uh, I know for, for conservative and reformed rabbis and many modern Orthodox rabbis, it's a very painful issue uh, with the chief rabbinate. You know, if you think Google has a monopoly, that's unspoken. The chief rabbinate in Israel is, uh, puts them to shame. Uh, they've had a monopoly on, on conversion for many years, and no matter what pressure has been brought to bear on them, whether it's legal, through the Supreme Court, through politics, through American jury, nothing has seemed to move the needle, uh, really, very, more, more than incrementally. Uh, I don't know if people miss this. I think it was like a blip on their news radar screen. But the chief rabbinate of the Sephardic community and the chief rabbinate of the Ashkenaz community came out and announced that, do not worry, Ivanka Trump is going to be, her conversion is going to be approved, not to worry, the standards are gonna change. That's actually, I know it seems like a little snippet and funny and maybe Hollywood-esque news, that's massive. They've been denying Rabbi Haskell Lookstein's ability to make conversions on his own without the approval of the chief rabbinate, which is just a trickle down to, uh, or I, I'm trickle across, I won't say down to other denominations, it's a trickle across to other denominations. Rabbi Gedalia Dov Schwartz, a massive, luminary of Torah has been refused to have his sign-offs on conversion. 
This is a massive issue between an American jury and an Israeli jury and Donald Trump's ascendance to the presidency. I can't speak to anti-Semitism. Jonathan is a far bigger expert than I am. But it just had a massive shift in Israel politics, religious politics. The separation between church and state and, and conversion and the chief rabbinate uh, just had a, made a massive announcement that we're not really thinking about and that I think is entirely due to uh, Donald Trump's uh, Orthodox Jewish family members. Rabbi Brosted, do you want to say something about the significance of Jews in the White House? I, I just, I, forgive me for not being too reassured by the presence of, um, of Ivanka Trump and Jared Kushner at the Shabbos table at the White House because, uh, and it's not only because of Mussolini and Hitler having Jewish lovers and Jewish doctors um, and nevertheless carrying on as they would. Um, w what we saw in the campaign with, is it, is it Julia Yaff? Is that how we pronounce her name? Yaffe? Um, who wrote um, what the Trumps perceived to be um, a negative article or an unfairly negative article about Melania profile, the vicious and really vile anti-Semitism that was spewed at her. And this was not an attack on her integrity as a journalist. This was about, this is a Jew who deserves to die, right? She should be gassed like the other Jews who died from the gas. And and when they were asked explicitly, how do you respond to this rash of anti-Semitism against this Jewish journalist, the most that they could muster was she wrote a really bad profile, right? I can't speak to, to the trolls. And so I believe that that's indicative of what we might see moving forward. And I'm not terribly reassured. Um, Ivanka Trump was already an Orthodox Jew celebrating Shabbat at the time of the Yaffe, um, of the, of the Yaffe episode. So I just, I, I, I'm sorry, but I don't believe that, that she's gonna be our Queen Esther in this case. <laughs> Dan, based on what we're hearing so far, what can we expect Trump's Israel policy to be? Um, I, I don't know. I have been making incorrect predictions about Donald Trump for the last 17 months, and I have no intention of <laughs> fixing that uh, record right now. But I'll come back to the point that I made earlier, which is as cathartic as the outrage contest can be. I think what each of my fellow panelists has done in passing, I think deserves far more consideration for the time that we have left, which is in addition to the outrage venting, which is understandable and in many cases appropriate. The question is, what can we do? What can we do as a community going forward? And I'll, as a jumping off point on that briefly, I'll come back to your question, which I didn't have a chance to weigh in on about anti-Semitism. Um, I don't think the question is whether there are more anti-Semites in the world today than there were 10 or 20 or 50 years ago. To me, the difference is not the numbers, but the fact that every one of them has their own television network. Every one of them, to be more specific, has one of these. And the great thing about social media for all of us is that it's empowering. And that can be for the good. Can you imagine organizing a march on Washington with one of these? But the haters get them too. And I don't know. I don't pretend to know, I think Jonathan's statistics I think are important in terms of the number of incidents of anti-Semitism. I don't pretend to know if there are more anti-Semites or not, but I know that they are able to give each other false comfort. Because there are haters in every community. And for years and years, for decades and decades, those haters sat at the end of the bar and they screamed at the television set, or they hid in their basement with their two or three friends who they could share that hatred with. Now. They can communicate with hundreds, thousands of people who harbor the same hatreds as they do, and they get false comfort from that, they get false succor from that, they get false support from that, which allows them to go out and commit the kind of atrocities that Jonathan is talking about. And of course we have to fight back against those haters in every way we can, not just anti-Semites, but bigots against African Americans and Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans and Muslim Americans, but I do not believe that 47% of the American electorate fits that description. I don't believe that 47% of the American electorate are anti-Semites or bigots or haters. As I said earlier, I think the overwhelming majority of the people who voted for Donald Trump are not haters. They're frightened. And 
rather than trying to convince an irrational person who is consumed by irrational hatreds, let's again, let's spend our time thinking about how to reach the rest of those frightened people. In addition to the minority communities which we have to stand and defend, let's reach out to that overwhelming majority of the Trump electorate and begin the conversation with them that the rabbi's students, to their credit, began with their opponents in the, uh, in the recent basketball game. To me, it's just a much more practical use of our time and our effort and our energy and our oxygen going forward. John, yes, please. So I totally agree with Dan about the need and the imperative being empathetic to those folks, as he defined them, that demographic that, that has felt alienated or felt ignored and maybe felt validated by some of the rhetoric uh, or the claims, if you will, the promises by Trump as a candidate. And I agree with the need to reach out to other minorities. And ADL's been doing the building coalitions for a long time. But I will also tell you that we are at our, we, it is foolish to ignore the alt-right and this white supremacist minority. I don't, would not suggest by any stretch of the imagination that 47% of America, you know, align with that ideology. But it is imperative that we push back those haters to the margins and the shadows where they belong. And I think when it comes to what can you do, speaking out and stepping up and calling out the bigotry when it happens is absolutely important. Whether it happens on social media or at the water cooler in your office or across the dinner table, I think it is imperative that all of us speak up with our voices as individuals and as a collective and don't allow this kind of bigotry to take root. I want to... I, I, I don't want to violate the rules, but I just... No, go ahead. We want the back and forth. The one point that, that Jonathan just made, because we are at 98.5% agreement here. Um, he's exactly right. We have to stand up and speak out forcefully against that kind of hatred, not just against our community, but against those other communities that we are equipped to defend. But you know what, guys? That's the easy part. That's the reflexive part. It's challenging, it's important, it's critical, but it's not that hard for a principled individual like almost all of us with a deep commitment to social justice to stand up against that hatred. What's just is necessary and much, much harder and much more counterintuitive and much more uncomfortable for many of us is to reach out to people who voted for the candidate who you consider to be the wrong one and try to find some common ground with that person so you can have a more productive conversation to make them a little bit less frightened. I'm not saying either or. I just want to make sure that we don't lapse into what's the easiest and the most familiar okay. at the expense of what's equally necessary. Thank you. Rabbi yeah, Dan, I, was, I want to jump off what you're saying. I think if we were, and it, just to paint in broad brush, stroke, brush strokes, and I hope nobody will take me to task for that, you know, if you had the centrist right and the alt-right and the centrist left, and uh, I don't know what you refer to the extreme left as, I don't want, Radical left, I like that. I don't want to get in trouble, so if you said it, I won't. Um, I think too frequently, the center-right has been looking and aligning themselves with the alt-right, even if we're not going to actually align. I mean, it's so anti-Semitic and so hateful, but we're voting that way. And I think the center-left has aligned themselves with the radical left. And I think what this moment calls for is some level of what I'd like to term radical moderation, where... We've made a decision as the people in the center who should be determining the future of this country to reach across with people we actually disagree with significantly, but who we agree with on being empathetic, being kind, uh, being respectful, being thoughtful in our debate and our dialogue. When Dan says, like, what's next? I think that's what's next. But we're not going to get there if we keep d calling every person who's a conservative a uh, racist or a bigot. Or, uh, you know, and if we call everybody, I'm sorry, the other direction, who's a liberal, you know, like a lunatic, uh, crazy liberal, you know, there's liberal hysteria, we use that term. It, it's not going to work. We, I, I think Dan's right. The majority of people who voted for Donald Trump, I can only hope, are not hateful, they're not uh, misogynistic, they're not, and the majority of people who voted for Hillary Clinton, I hope that they're not, uh, they haven't lost their brains and just think we should do everything liberal. You know, that's the kind of uh, just incendiary dis names we call each other and the radical moderation that I think we need is it's when moderates look at each other and say we got to join together 
at the end of the day, someone's going to run the country. Maybe it's someone from your side, maybe it's someone from our side of the aisle, but it's going to be someone who's moderate. And that hasn't happened, and I know it's easier said than done. For me, it starts with the students. It's why I'm okay with a 50-50 vote at the school. If we think that it's either us or you, and we're entrenching ourselves and digging in, so the, 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 the edges are going to be the ones to succeed and grab the attention. The alt-right's going to grow, and the radical left is going to grow. And as we all just mentioned, and Rabbi Browse pointed out so eloquently, that's, the Jews are going are to suffer. I'm not saying only in our self-interest we should be worried about this, but that's actually the most scary thought that the, the uh, edges are gonna get stronger. We, that's not good for us, and I think we need to, to push for that notion of like moderation at a very high level. Thank you. I wanna ask uh, one more question about Israel, and then we're gonna move to some of the audience questions. So in 2013, uh, the potential Secretary of Defense, James Mattis said, quote, I paid a military security price every day because the Americans were seen as biased in support of Israel and that moderates all the moderate Arabs who want to be with us because they can't come out publicly in support of people who don't show respect for Arab Palestinians. So the question to the panel is, does the argument that an ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict, does the argument that it is a danger to US security have any merit? And how will it affect Israel if the potential Secretary of Defense is interested in currying favor with the Arab world. So, and I'll jump at once. I don't know that developing, your term currying favor, my term developing stronger relationships with the Arab world necessar is, is necessarily a zero sum game in terms of our relationships with Israel. What's clearly been, what, what I believe has been happening in the Middle East for some years now is many of the relatively, and I emphasize the word relatively, moderate Arab nations have allowed their hatred of Israel to be superseded by their fear of Iran. And I think if there is an opportunity, um, as administrations of both parties over the last couple of decades have attempted uh, to strengthen relationships with those nations that are fearful of Iran, if those relationships can be strengthened without compromising our relationship with Israel, I think that is a net benefit for both Israel and the United States. I, under, I understand the premise of General Mattis's uh, point, and he certainly articulated it in a way that I would not have. But going back to the point that Jonathan made at the very beginning of this panel, which I interpreted as patience, I'm willing to assume that what a very blustery, lifelong military leader who enjoys the nickname of Mad Dog was saying in a much more aggressive way than I would have, is that we can form relationships with the Arab nations in a way that would not have been previous, uh, possible a generation ago without compromising our relationship with Israel. Does anyone else want to comment? Rabbi Browse, you want to say anything about U.S.-Israel, Trump administration I, impact on the I US? actually wanted to respond to something Rabbi Siegel said earlier, but if you want to stick to Israel first, I'll... Which way do you want to do it? Let's go with Israel, and then we're going to go to the audience questions. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think like everyone, everyone on the panelists, it's a, court, a little bit of a let's wait and see. I do think his appointment of Nikki Haley as U.N. ambassador is a strong statement to those who, who believe BDS is not just anti-Israel but anti-Semitic. Uh, she has fought very valiantly and vigilantly against that, and I think that that's a super important point uh, that Trump's administration, um, you know, at least in that step, has made a, a huge piece there. I, I do want to mention one thing, which I think is, you know, we, we sometimes talk big up here, and what we're not mentioning is, is that Trump is the first president in the United States history who is a businessman. He is not worried about the, well, I shouldn't say this. I don't believe he's worried about the morals and the values of America and what it stands for. He's worried about the bottom line. And the bottom line is what matters to him. He's a businessman who's running the largest company in the world. It's the most powerful company in the world. Whether you love him and you're, uh, people who love him are probably like, yeah, he's a businessman who's running the largest company in the world. Yeah, of course, he's going to be great at it. Or you hate him and you're like, that's the most awful thing I've ever heard. Uh, that's who he is. I think that bodes well for Israel. I think... Uh, Israel has been really challenged for the last few years in terms of our more, you know, there's been a moral equivalency. B 
between Israel and uh, the, the neighboring states and sort of how we deal with them and what that looks like. And it's really hard. Nobody understands what that's like to be surrounded. And so I think we've, we've gotten into a mudslinging fight about who's more moral, who's less moral. At the end of the day, in terms of business, I don't think we could, we should work. I mean, Israel's incredible. Uh, the, the partnerships that they have with, whether it's California, the water, uh, drip irrigation, water saving, uh, renewable energy, Israel's at the forefront of building businesses for, it, for the size of the country. It's incredible. I, I am hopeful. Again, maybe I know Sharon has been less hopeful in all of the questions I've been hopeful about, so you may be less hopeful. But I am hopeful that given who he is as a businessman, I think this bodes well for Israel. I do think the question that all of us as heads of or Jewish organizations or participants of Jewish organizations need to figure out is, how do we want to interact with businessman President Donald Trump? Because that may require us to give up certain of our values in the pursuit of expediency and pragmatism. Uh, I think we're going to see that in school vouchers, a, a big divide between the Orthodox and the uh, rest of the Jewish community. But I think that that's going to be a massive shift that we haven't thought about. I think it'll be good for Israel because Israel is good for business. But I do think President-elect Donald Trump is a, is a businessman at heart, and we as a Jewish community and our Jewish communal organizations need to figure out what we're willing to sacrifice to make those business deals with I'm, him. I'm really glad that you said that, because one of the things I wanted to ask is what Jewish leaders from history can serve as guides for us in how to negotiate and navigate the relationship between our religious community and a presidential administration? Okay, I'd like to not answer that question, but instead to say two things that will make me very unpopular here. The first, uh, with regards to Israel, and the second, uh, a response to something Rabbi Siegel said earlier. Um, one, I, I just want to name Syria right now, because given what's happening in Aleppo in this very moment as we speak. Um, a couple of years ago, we were on a community trip to Israel, and we were in the Golan Heights, and we were on a security tour of the Golan Heights, looking over into Syria and seeing smoke rising from an attack of ISIS, okay? At the time, we were told that Saudi Arabia and Israel, have, which many people have, have spoken about, and Tal Becker speaks about, one of Israel's lead peace negotiators, that Israel and Saudi Arabia have a shared interest in, uh, in finding a alignment right now in order to fight some of the more pernicious forces at play in the region. But Saudi Arabia has made it clear to Israel that the, uh, that the only way that they can form an alliance is through Ramallah. In other words, that there has to be a resolution to the conflict with the Palestinians in order for there to be a broader regional alignment that happens. And I believe that it is at our peril that we continue to take the priority away from finding a resolution to the conflict with the Palestinians um, fi allowing right-wing interests within the government in Israel to push forward in settlement building, to entrench themselves. Um, we heard the other day, just the other day, from a professor at Tel Aviv University who is nonpartisan, who is talking about the really devastating uh, position that Israel's, the startup nation's economy is in right now, that we cannot continue at the pace that we're going in Israel because we have determined that we no longer prioritize hospitals and roads and education inside Israel, within the green line, because our priorities are elsewhere, our resources are going elsewhere, and Israel's suffering as a result. And if we believe that supporting, having a right-wing American government that supports a right-wing Israeli government in continuing to perpetuate these kinds of policies, many of us believe that this will lead ultimately to the demise of Israel. And so I, I have to say, I, I think that it is not in our best interest to continue to put aside um, the two-state solution as if it's some kind of naive dream um, and to allow right-wing forces that frankly don't know or understand very much about the geopolitical situation in Israel um, right now to, to come out with bold statements and aggressions that, that many people, my, my brother who is Israeli, who lives with his wife and three children in Renana, said at the, at the mention of several of the people who would be whispering in the ear of Donald Trump, you know that Jewish blood will spill from some of the actions, the more, uh, the more radical actions that they're talking about doing, so-called in the support of the state of Israel. That these are very dangerous actions and I think we have to be extremely careful about the way that we proceed there. In response to Rabbi Siegel, I also, um, forgive me um, once again, but I, I, I do, object to a kind of moral equivalency between, and this effort to listen to the Trump supporters, and I'm reading Arlie Hochschild's incredible book right now, 
strangers in their own land and really trying to get into the mindset of the Trump supporters and the red states. She goes into the reddest of red states to try to understand the great paradox, which is why it is that people who have, on average, an eight, year, eight years less of life expectancy um, than people who live in blue states still vote against policies that would help them um, with their health care coverage. Why people who are dying, they, ha they call this area next to the Mississippi River Cancer Alley because there's so many petrochemical factories that are set up there. It's not people in Los Angeles and San Francisco that are, that are dying from those uh, factories. It's the people in Louisiana, who, many of whom are Tea Party supporters. So trying to really understand how can you be opposed to EPA regulations, of, how can you be opposed to regulating um, environmental, um, in, environmental violations when you're the ones who are suffering, I think it's extremely important that we try to understand what's going on there. At the same time, I do find it to be extremely problematic to create a moral equivalency between the two candidates that went head-to-head uh, -head with one another in November and between the populations of people who so strongly supported one or the other. Because this, we saw, what we saw before us was really not about right versus left. It was not about conservative versus liberal. It was not about Democrat versus Republican. The kind of language that was used, the dog whistles that we heard, the explicit statements of attack against vulnerable minority populations. I'm talking about LGBT people. I'm talking about Muslims and Mexicans and others. The permission that was given to attack Jews. These things are completely not parallel to having a second email server that, make people, that makes people profoundly uncomfortable. And, and people can, again, I say, I don't believe that this is about policy. This is not about what does it mean to be fisc more fiscally responsible and should we change the tax code or not. I'm happy to, you know, I'm not happy. I could understand losing an election on those terms and I would walk away and, and, you know, and sit down across the table and try to understand those who voted differently. This is very different. I believe that this was more about decency and indecency. And I don't believe that everybody who voted for Trump is a racist or an anti-Semite or a bigot. But I do believe that there was a certain amount of willful blindness toward those dog whistles and those explicit statements that were bigoted, anti-Semitic, and racist and misogynistic in order to support a candidate whose fiscal policies you might have preferred or whose Israel approach you might have preferred. And I think that is, that is a moral crisis for our country. She, she's here every Shabbos, folks, so you're all welcome to come back. Same time, same place on Shabbos. Okay, a uh, couple audience questions, and then we are going to call it a night. Uh, Jonathan, can I, can I, I think... Can I just say one thing? Uh, no, not right now. No, I'm sorry. I, but, okay, but I think this is the core of what we're here for, because okay. I think... 30, um, 30 seconds. Thir I get 30 seconds. 30 Great. seconds. I actually... I, for the people who... I, listen, I, I love Sharon, but I think Sharon's speech... And we're flying on a flight together to Newark tonight to go to the White House tomorrow. Um, the, the Sharon speech in some way minimizes maybe unintentionally, the whole swath of people who, you, you say, like, it's, it's some, some fiscal policies I'm not sure about, some policies about Israel, as if those are throwaway lines. This was a very painful election for a lot of people who I don't think made a very casual decision to vote against the things that they value in terms of minorities and LGBT rights and abortion and all of those things. They voted because, and the email server was a bigger deal than you're giving it credit for. And I think sometimes when we do that and we throw that out and we get a standing round of applause, I think that's the echo chamber that Nicholas Kristof just wrote about this Sunday. I think it's when we can't hear each other. I would like to say to the people who didn't clap, I hope we were listening to Sharon. She has something deep and important to say. She believes as much as anyone I've ever met in the value of every human being. So when you disagree with her and you think, ah, I can't believe you're saying that and you're so off, to, off, off the reservation. I think the people who didn't clap should be listening to Sharon and thinking, wow, how important it is. But I think the people who clapped, I think we need to be careful not to fall into our echo chamber, which is what got us here in the first place. Thank you. And you know, I just, I just want to point to that real quickly. Um, rabbi Brous, so as a rabbi who represents the Jewish community, can you offer us any insight into the 30% of Jewish voters in which choosing Trump was a reasonable choice? I think, I think we co covered this earlier about trying to, uh, trying to understand uh, what, the, what was driving that population. And I, I do believe that it was about 
primarily about fear and concern for Israel. So, I mean, that, that's my sense of, the, um, of that demographic. So, um, and I don't mean to minimize it at all, but the reason I say in some vague way fiscal policy is because as, you, uh, as we all saw, there were very few specifics about what kind of policies Trump would enact. And when, we, when I say out of some vague sense that it would be better for Israel, it's because we, an hour before his APEC speech, he said that he was gonna have Israel repay their loans. So we really don't know what he's gonna do for Israel. We had a vague sense that this guy would be better for Israel. Not we, many people had a vague sense. So that, I'm not trying to downplay what the aching in the heart was, but it, we don't have specifics. It's not like we had an anti-Israel and then a pro-Israel candidate on, uh, on the stage. But you just spoke at length about decency and you talked about willful blindness. So when you say those things, are you saying that 30% of the Jewish community was exercising willful blindness and lacks decency? I will say this, it's not only 30% of the Jewish community, it's 47% of the country. Yes, I believe, I believe that we have a moral crisis in the country today. And, and by the way, we all live in an echo chamber and everybody's in a bubble. My bubble is the LA progressive multi-faith you know, community. Other people live in the Brooklyn bubble. Other people live in the Louisiana bubble, in the Cancer Alley bubble. We all live in a bubble. We all talk to the people who, you know, who, who generally tend to, to think like, the, like us. And, and I don't, I, I mean, I, look, I'll tell you one thing. I was recently, I recently gave a speech um, in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And afterwards, someone came over and we were talking about fake news and open internet. And if the internet and net neutrality actually um, had something very significant to do with the outcome of this election. And afterwards she came over to me and she said, and I said, I'm extremely concerned about fake news. Deborah Lipstadt came here to speak about Holocaust denialism just a couple weeks before, um, before the election. And we had no idea exactly how pertinent that talk would be, right? And she was talking about people who, who are Sandy Hook deniers. Now we know that one of the principal Sandy Hook deniers is whispering in the ear of the president-elect. There are people who try to blur the boundary between truth and falsehood. And I was talking about how problematic that is. And, um, and she said to me, I do believe that there's fake news. It's called the New York Times and the Washington Post. And she said, thank God we have the internet to give us the truth. And I said, are you really saying that you believe the editorial standards of the New York Times are worse than the editorial standards of a 16-year-old in the former Soviet Union who's getting $6,000 a day on bait by posting bait click about how Hillary Clinton has some fatal disease. And she said, I bet you read that story in the New York Times. So look, I think we have a real problem on our hands right now. And, we're, and we, are all in a, um, we are all in a bubble, but I know that my bubble is about listening to news which comes from a variety of perspectives, but all of which I believe have the highest editorial standard. Okay, thank you. Um, we want to let everyone get out of here very soon, so I'm going to do a few quick, please, 15, 30-second responses. Jonathan, I think this one is for you. Where's the reasonable line between free speech and hate speech, and is there anything policy-wise or legislatively we can do to eradicate hate speech? So free speech is expressing ideas. It becomes something, we'll call it hate speech, or something else when it starts to intimidate and terrorize and threaten individuals particularly because of inalienable characteristics that they can't change. That isn't free speech. That's something else and needs to be called out and shut down. And we need sort of laws and policy to catch up um, to the internet and, and social media, like cyber stalking laws aren't there yet. Laws against doxing, laws against other kind of techniques that the trolls use, absolutely need to be updated and adapted to a digital age. Uh, why are we focusing on the anti-Semitism of the Trump administration and not on the anti-Semitism Bernie Sanders experienced from his own political party? Anyone, go for it. So look, the ADL called out Bernie Sanders for his ridiculous statement about casualties in Gaza when he claimed that 15, the Israelis wantonly killed 15,000 uh, Palestinian civilians. Oh, um, I, don't, I, I, have, I don't know the exact emails to give you any, to give an answer to that. Okay, uh, moving on. Both 50-something white... But, but by the way, the serial pattern and repetitive anti-Semitism, tweeting out messages from white supremacists when you are a pres aspire to be the president of the United States is a problem. Period. 
Okay, um, Keith Ellison has a negative voting record on Israel. How would his appointment as DNC head affect the U.S.-Israel relationship and the U.S.-Jewish community? And Greenblatt, can you explain ADL's response? I guess that's directed at me. Uh, the Keith Ellison question is a complicated one. I think there are certainly, he has certainly um, been someone who has done tshuva for his prior relationship affiliation with the Nation of Islam, and we take people at their word. And we also take people at their votes. And the way that he's voted in certain situations against the State of Israel in major moments like Iron Dome is very confusing to us, and we don't agree with it. And his flirtation and support with certain folks in, around the Iran deal. Look, many people in this room, probably many people up here, may have supported the Iran deal. The ADL did not. But what's much more problematic is engaging with certain folks who supported the deal who are apologists for the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is one of the most anti-American, anti-Semitic, anti-human rights, illiberal governments on the planet Earth. And that I can't really countenance. Look, but uh, we still don't know where Keith would go with if he becomes chair of the Democratic Party. He still has a lot of opportunity to explain where he stands, and I look forward to seeing that happen. Okay, so last question. Really quickly, each of you, we started with a conversation about values. Let's hear one shared communal value that we can reclaim as the Jewish community after this whole crazy experience. Um, what's, what are the values we can go back to that we have in common and that we share? Let's say one. Yeah, like a shared Jewish communal value that we can sort of reclaim uh, as a kind of uniting effort. Justice. I would say debate for the sake of heaven, that we should be debating with each other and arguing, but for the, for the goal of reaching a, a truth, not just reaching our own truth. I know this is going to sound ridiculous given where I've been for the last two hours, but hope. Because I actually believe that this is a core, this is a core religious and, and foundational premise of our tradition, the trajectory from darkness to light. And this is not where our story ends as a people, as a nation. Thank you. A commitment, a commitment to uplift our community, our entire community, not just the members of the community who voted for the same candidate that we did. Thank you. Let's give a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Shal Hevet. Thank you, audience, for being here. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Jewish Journal Crucial Conversation.